used uh, consumer theory to derive the demand curve, and now we're continuing on our exploration of how to use producer theory to derive the supply curve. Now, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, but I think it's important to understand, we, with, per, with consumer theory, we were given a budget amount. Your parents gave you some budget. Based on that, all you had to do was maximize utility, find that those tangencies between the difference curve and the budget constraint, and you were done. With producer theory, we have an extra step, which is last time we derived a long-run output expansion path, or a long-run cost curve, which showed the cost-minimizing way to produce any one of a given number of quantities. But we didn't yet figure out which quantity to produce. So we know now after the last lecture that if I give you a quantity I want you to produce, you can tell me the cost minimizing way to produce that. But I, we haven't yet figured out how do you decide what quantity to produce. And to do that, we add the extra step with producer theory that wouldn't have a consumer theory, which is we bring in the market. Okay? And what we're going to do over the next series of four or five lectures is talk about how we bring in the market to help pin down the final condition, to help pin down the quantity the firm actually produces. And the reason this is complicated is because markets can operate very differently. We're going to start by talking about one extreme, which is the extreme of a perfectly competitive market, and how firms operate under a perfectly competitive market, how that pins down the quantity. We're then going to swing to the other extreme after a few lectures and talk about monopoly markets, where there's only one firm in the market, so it's not competitive, and talk about how that pins down the quantity that's produced. And then we'll come in between to talk about one of my favorite words in economics, oligopoly markets, which are markets with more than one, but fewer than, more than one participant. So they're somewhat competitive, but they're not perfectly competitive. So that's what we'll do over the next few lectures. That's sort of the roadmap. We're going to start and spend most of our time on perfect competition. So that's what I want to talk about today. This is sort of the extreme that economists like to focus on. And it's a useful benchmark for thinking about how firms would behave. It's not reality. No extreme is ever reality. But it's a useful starting point for thinking about how firms behave. OK? Now, technically, what do you mean by perfect competition? Technically, a perfectly competitive market is one where firms are price takers. Firms are price takers. Um, on both the output in and input side. Technically, a perfectly competitive market is when firms are price takers on both the output and input side. What does that mean? That means that firms cannot independently influence the price that is charged for their goods or the price they pay for their inputs that the firm doesn't in any way set the price, either the price that they charge for their goods or the price that they pay for their inputs. No action they can take will affect those prices. So no action a firm can take will affect the prices they sell their goods for or they pay for their inputs. When will this be true? This will be true under two conditions. First of all, when uh, demand for the firm, demand facing the firm, OK, is perfectly elastic. Not demand for the whole market, but demand facing the firm is perfectly elastic. And the supply uh, for the firm's inputs is perfectly elastic. So the demand for the firm's goods is perfectly elastic, and the supply of the inputs to the firm is perfectly elastic. Okay, So those are the conditions under which we will have perfect competition. The demand for the firm's outputs, I should say firm's outputs. Demand for the firm's outputs is perfectly elastic. Supply of the firm's inputs is perfectly elastic. Okay, So let's focus on the first initially. Look at figure 10-1. Figure 10-1 is an example of a firm facing perfectly elastic demand. Now, here is a trick I'm going to try to use consistently, but it's OK to jump me if I get this wrong. Okay, I'm going to try to use, for the rest of this course, or the rest of this section, I'm going to try to use little q, 
when I mean a firm, and big Q when I mean a market. So little Q is going to refer to a firm, and big Q is going to refer to the market. So now we're talking about a firm, and that firm has a choice of little Qs to produce, little Q1, little Q2, et cetera. Okay? And it's going to face some price. Uh, if demand is perfectly elastic at that price, that means that the firm can choose its quantity as its supply curve shifts around, but it can't change the price it pays. That price is set by that perfect elasticity condition. Okay? Now, when does it make sense that demand be perfectly elastic? Well, demand be perfectly elastic under several conditions, okay? each of which is important. First of all, consumers believe that firms sell identical products. Now, once again, the products don't have to be identical, but consumers have to believe they're identical. So if consumers believe that there's a series of firms in a market that sell identical products. The second is that prices are fully known. There's no, um, uh, I'm sorry, let me actually rewrite that. Consumers know, prices are fully known, so let's put that more explicitly. Consumers know all prices. So the consumers know what price is charged by every firm. OK? And then finally, there are low transaction costs, transaction or shopping costs, that it's easy to shop across firms. OK? So basically, if consumers believe that products are identical, that they know all the prices firms are charging, and they can pretty easily shop across various firms, then demand can be perfectly elastic. So the classic example would be thinking about eBay. Okay? Think about eBay or, or um, if you think about shopping or something on eBay, if you're shopping for a good and you put in that good in eBay, now often the good is not typically identical, but let's think about shopping for a specific good on eBay. Okay? For a specific kind of computer chip or a specific kind of uh, camera, an exact model of a camera. OK? If you think about something that um, is, uh, is identical, then eBay lists the prices, and it's pretty easy to compare them and shop across them. OK? So that's close to perfect, but it's still not perfect, because there still could be quality differences you don't observe. And there still could be price information you don't observe. For example, some of the prices may include be shipping inclusive, others may not. Some prices may include, yeah. Has an option so you can include the shipping. eBay has an option to include the shipping, but there's a lot of, if you look at goods, there's a lot of hidden attributes firms can do. They can have different levels of, if you're looking at a good, they can have different levels of support for that good. They can have different levels of cost of fix, of repairs for that good, et cetera. So it's hard to make, it's hard to meet these conditions. Probably the closest thing that we think of, is, that I have in mind, I think about this, is thinking about going to, a tourist area, especially in a less developed country, and shopping at a bazaar for goods. If you go to a tourist area in a less developed country, there's a bunch of tables set up that's on the same crap over and over and over again. Okay? And it's pretty easy to look and see it's the same crap. It's like in developed countries. I mean, I was just in France, there's like tons of copies of the Eiffel Tower. You go into the Eiffel Tower, there's like a hundred guys selling these same little crappy statues of the Eiffel Tower. Okay? And you can look and they're all the same, and they're all the goddamn Eiffel Tower, and basically you know, basically in that situation, if one guy standing here asked a dollar more or a euro more than this guy standing here for the Eiffel Tower, I'm going to buy it over here. It's identical. They're all just little statues of the Eiffel Tower. Okay? So basically, that's kind of what we think of as a perfectly elastic demand. Then in that situation, I'm going to have a perfectly elastic demand for those little statuettes. Okay? So that's sort of how we think about perfectly elastic demand. 